when I first came there to teach, there was just the one course, but I built up to the point where I had several different courses offered and uh, advanced students uh, taking the physics as well as just the uh, pre-meds and uh, such that had to have a physics course. In fact, we finally got to the point where we uh, introduced a course called Introduction to Science where every candidate for a bachelor's degree in the college was supposed to take that course if you didn't want to take a specific science course you'd have to take this introduction where each one of us got a turn at lecturing on biology and physics and chemistry and astronomy and so on. Well, I also, of course, in building up these courses, it wasn't just a question of introducing them into a catalog and getting faculty approval to do so. Uh, you have to have some students who will take those courses, and if they're elective courses, why, how do you get students? Well, if you like, you can say, by making the courses attractive, uh, you've got to make the course interesting to the student. So uh, Jim, we don't have your microphone on. They, uh, that's right experiments and we did and the demonstrations I gave in a lecture uh, such that they would interest people okay. and uh, as a result I, I uh, became better and better known apparently at Ursinus for uh, uh, performing on a skateboard. Uh, it was often referred to as uh, roller skates but it was actually a board with skate wheels on it in which I was uh, putting this board on the top of a lecture desk and then I stood on the board and if every time I tried to move, if I moved to the right, well the board started moving to the left. Much as if you're trying to walk in a inside of a canoe which is uh, freely floating in the water and not tethered to anything. So every time you walk one way the canoe goes the other way. And uh, this is an illustration of Newton's laws of motion and I thought that uh, I could that way get a little more uh, attention to demonstrating some actual cases, instances where you could see how this worked. So each year as I did that, why uh, more and more people heard about it and I finally uh, had quite a number of people that were coming from other classes at Christmas time to hear a special lecture which I gave. As some of my students uh, now realize, uh, they didn't then. I was attempting in, at Christmas time to give something similar to the lectures at the Royal Society, Christmas lectures and things of that sort, where they tried to interest students in physics or whatever, science, uh, by having special lectures which the students could attend during the holidays. Well. That uh, lecture at Christmas time was also trying to make use of the fact that all the students on the day before the Christmas holiday when they would go home, all the students stayed up all night and they had a big sh shindig, uh, some kind of uh, session all night uh, which they hardly ever slept of course. And so if they came to class the next day why uh, they probably only with difficulty could stay awake. And many of the professors at the college said that there was nothing you could teach them on such a day. Uh, you might just as well dismiss the class, but uh, it was frowned on to uh, dismiss the class. You should, should at least take roll because otherwise uh, everybody would cut class the, the day of the last day before the holiday. So <clears throat> I made it a rule then every year to have this Christmas lecture just the last day before the holiday. And it got so that the, not only the uh, students in my own physics classes would come to this, but also uh, classes f uh, in other subjects would appear and I had to take the large lecture hall instead of the small lecture hall in order to accommodate all this. And in fact, I began to see in the later years uh, some of my colleagues, members of the faculty, sitting in the front row 
<laughs> coming to this lecture. After they had dismissed their class because they'd said, can't we go over and see Dr. Mockley's lecture? Why then uh, the professor who had dismissed them would come along. Now this is particularly true, for instance, of a philosophy teacher that we had out there named Carl Vernon Tower. I think he a PhD from Brown University. And uh, for all the time I was there, why well, he was quite a uh, landmark on the campus. He uh, actually was well known for uh, his uh, attraction to a certain uh, kind of drink, which I think was alcoholic, uh, at a time when uh, alcohol of any form was frowned on by the uh, reigning uh, administration. But uh, regardless of that, why he was a very nice fellow and everybody liked him. And his students, I think, particularly appreciated the fact that uh, he too would come along <laughs> to see these Christmas lectures. Well, I won't dwell on the Christmas lectures particularly, but uh, I was told recently that uh, uh, there are still scars on the top of the stone uh, lecture tables, which they say are caused by the roller skates which I used when I was demonstrating the Newton's laws of motion. And there were a lot of other things that I tried to do with uh, uh, available materials, like this colored cellophane and spectrographic work, for instance, was an easy, cheap way of uh, uh, illustrating some things. And I used the wrapping of my Christmas presents to get the colored cellophane. and. Uh, Needless to say, another cheap way out was to use uh, film replicas of the ruled gratings which Dr. Wood had produced down at Hopkins. You could peel off a uh, plastic film that you had flowed onto one of these ruled glass plates and you could get from that film the same kinds of uh, spectroscop spectroscopic uh, effects, dispersion of light into various colors. You could get that by using these plastic films, which are, oh, immensely cheaper, of course, than those films, those glass plates, which had to be ruled ca very carefully with uh, very carefully selected diamond edges and done slowly so that the temperature would not disrupt the uniformity of the uh, process and so on. So with these just cheap little films why one could make a lot of demonstrations in optics. Well, I won't go on with the different things that were done, but what we did was to, as cheaply as possible, amplify a lot of the demonstrations and physics equipment uh, to make the courses more interesting. And I did build up a larger uh, number of students attending these courses. There was, at the same time, a gradual growth of the whole college. So there were more pre-med students, for instance, who had to take physics, as well as more other people that might elect it. So that was what life was being like as far as the student body was concerned and uh, my fun in teaching it. And I've subsequently learned that uh, many of these students uh, have remembered and appreciated the fact that I took them to various research laboratories uh, including the Weather Bureau, incidentally, which you might not call a research laboratory, but it was an experience to go to Washington and to help me copy weather data, which we'd bring back to our sinus and put through the statistical mill which I was building. The uh, part of the mill which I was building involved not just a few students who uh, were trained to process the data that we brought back, but also I tried to build some equipment which I thought would hasten the process whereby I would get some data which would statistically prove or at least uh, make very likely the fact that uh, the sun did have something to do with our weather besides just being the driving source of power for the weather. That variations in the sun might have something to do with how the weather behaved. And so in trying to uh, analyze, for instance, some of these 27-day uh, uh, occurrences in 
precipitation, which might have to do with the rotation of the sun, why I built something called a harmonic analyzer, which tried to analyze the, all the precipitation data that I'd acquired into uh, components which would show to what extent there was a 27-day wave and half of that, a 13-and-a-half-day wave and so on in the data. And so I had a student uh, setting up the data in knobs and reading meters and so forth. This kind of a calculation uh, doesn't have to be very accurate and so a device which I could easily build there, uh, depending just on Ohm's law and such things, uh, uh, it's called an analog computer, that was quite uh, acceptable for doing that particular job. But in other places, what I wanted were kinds of calculations to develop the statistics which had to be done fairly accurately to mean anything, and uh, correlations between one variable and another, uh, where you had to sum a lot of squares and sum a lot of products and do accurate divisions and all kinds of arithmetic processes. And then, strangely enough, if you wanted to do that again with another set of data uh, and you were correlating pairs of data, maybe it was the same sun that you were working on each time, it was just a different weather variable, to do this with any common tools, that, uh, like a desk calculating machine, you would have to punch the same data into the keys all over again. It had no memory, had no way of helping you, having gone through this process once, not to have to go through it a second time. Well, I knew, lots of people knew, that one way out of that difficulty is to use punch card machines. Uh, that is the machine-readable form, you might say, for your data. That was the kind of thing that was developed first at the Census Bureau and <coughs> now used, I mean in the 1930s, used uh, by all kinds of business and accounting people. But it was beginning to be used for some scientific calculation and I may mention the fact that the uh, man at uh, uh, the company up in Boston, the what's his name, Arthur D. Little Laboratory, uh, was computing some of the energy levels of molecules that way. Well, there was another place where they were doing this kind of work, and I was aware of it. And that was a man named Eckert. His name is Wallace Eckert, uh, not to be confused with another Eckert which enters into this story. And Wallace Eckert wrote a book on scientific computations by punch card methods. He wrote this as a result of his experience <coughs> at the Naval Observatory in Washington. And there he was computing the tables which are useful for navigational purposes, the things that tell you for each day and sometimes for each hour and each minute what to expect when you look up and try to navigate by the stars and the sun and the moon and so on. And he said that he could do these computations which were scientific in type better with punch card equipment than could be done with the other equipment, dust calculators and so forth, which were then the most customary thing for scientific calculations. Well, I had his book, I read his book, and so on. And all that's fine, except that I didn't have any punch card equipment. And the companies that had that kind of equipment wanted what I considered too much money to rent them. You know, I, just to punch the cards, you might have to pay 50 or $100 a month to get a card punch. And uh, then to use those cards, once you'd gotten them punched, you had to pay more money again. And multiplication was one of the worst things that those machines did. They uh, were slow to the point of maybe taking a couple seconds to produce a product of two six-digit numbers. And uh, it was still like waiting forever as far as I was concerned. Well, why was I feeling that something better could be done? Well, 
I was taking my students out on trips to various laboratories. And one of these was the one at Carnegie Institution in Washington, where Dr. Hafstead and Dr. Tuve were uh, making their atomic nuclear uh, investigations. And they had to have uh, scaling circuits to count how fast uh, various particles came down a tube and uh, were the result indicating uh, the certain atom had been blown apart or fissioned or something of that sort. Well, that was one place, but right over in Swarthmore campus was a place called Bartlow Research Foundation where my father's boss had gone, Dr. W.F.G. Swan, uh, was head of the Bartlow Research Laboratory, which was stationed at the uh, Swarthmore campus. It's now moved to the University of Delaware, but for many years it was on Swarthmore campus, and I would take students over there, and we would see some of the scientists there working with vacuum tubes, which could distinguish between pulses, which occurred sometimes as close as a millionth of a second apart. Well, gee, if you can count and distinguish pulses which are occurring at uh, rates which sometimes vary, of course, but are uh, as close together sometimes as a millionth of a second, and maybe very slow sometimes, but uh, you can somehow keep track of these things, it seemed obvious to me that uh, those same abilities of vacuum tube circuits could be used for the just the mere act of computation. Generate your own pulses your own way, not have them necessarily become uh, the result of some measurement of nature's cosmic rays or nature's uh, nuclear experiments. Just generate your pulses on purpose to represent numbers, and then you get these counting circuits, or scaling circuits as they call them, to operate with these numbers, and multiply, divide, as well as add and subtract. Why not? Well, nobody had any answer to that, why not? <laughs> and I was getting, with my physical society membership, uh, not just the uh, main uh, magazine, the, um, physical review, but also the review of scientific instruments which contained articles on, circuits for, and so forth, these scaling circuits. And uh, so, in addition to just putting those in the library of the college so that anybody, any student could have use of them, why well, I was reading them myself and starting to build things which were like the circuits I saw in those magazines. And all this was going on in the 1930s. So I was simultaneously, you might say, directing some students to add up weather data on old second-hand computing and adding machines that I had acquired. And I was simultaneously with that building an analog computer for which, which turned out to be very useful for speeding up the time in which it not needed for a reduction of data on atmospheric tides or on solar rotations and things of that sort, and simultaneously teaching, of course, and simultaneously uh, trying out these various circuits, which I got out of review of the uh, scientific instruments and other places. Uh, I even, I think, subscribed to Electronics Magazine uh, in case there might be some little points of uh, technique that I might develop, find out there. All of these things, trying to see how we could get these vacuum tubes to aid in speeding up computation. And so I thought I needed to know more about electronics, of course, to do this. And as one evidence of my interest in trying to do that was that Somewhere in 1935 or 36, I went down to the Moore School and took an evening graduate course from a man named uh, Knox McElwain, who is no longer with us. But uh, he taught, taught me a lot of things about 
electrical engineering and mathematics and everything, seemed almost everything except vacuum tubes. We developed uh, ad nauseum uh, expressions which uh, were Taylor series and Maclaurin series in calculus for what would happen because of the space charge which might occur inside of a vacuum tube. But uh, there was nothing that had to do with how you put a vacuum tube in a circuit and make it do something. Absolutely foreign to the question of uh, how you make a scaling circuit uh, at, behave like a computer. That was far away from what he was touching upon. But he was doing in the tradition of the Moore School, giving us the fundamentals of how you apply physics and mathematics to engineering problems. And that was his aim, and that's what he was doing. Uh, Dr. Swan also taught there incidentally, and Eckert remembers him for a phrase about uh, uh, there are problems of simplicity and problems of that aren't simple. Then you have to worry about are the problems complex? Or are they perplexing? If they're problems of complexity, well then, of course, just put enough people on it and enough effort and so forth, somebody can do them. But the perplexing problems are the ones that you don't really know how to do. And there's a lot of problem that are that, like that. And just by putting more people on, you don't solve the problem. Well, uh, Dr. Swan was a great old guy. But uh, the, uh, he was uh, uh, there evening courses uh, during the time when I joined the uh, Moore School, which we will get to in a moment or two. But at this period in my life, in the 1930s, why well, here I was teaching and learning about the cosmic rays and other tools which, uh, I mean, the cosmic ray instruments and tools which enabled one to use vacuum tubes to uh, count pulses rather rapidly. I was also, of course, interested in the calculating instruments that were then available and come like 1939, why uh, one of the things I did was take off to the World's Fair in New York City, out in the Flushing Meadows, I believe it was, and uh, I'd spent two days there maybe visiting the Remington Rand and the IBM exhibits, and of course I looked around to see what Monroe and Marchant and those people had, but nothing new there. Uh, a little advance maybe in the techniques of mechanical machines. And uh, actually the most interesting thing I saw of the IBM exhibit was a cryptographic device which somehow in a black box managed to take the text which you typed in a one typewriter and come out with some garbage, it looked like gibberish you might say, on another typewriter, which was the letters permuted and affected in some way so as to give a certain amount of privacy and uh, security. Uh, mainly, this device was for uh, uh, commercial use, I think, between companies trying to just trans give messages, from, transmit them from one place to another in their own company. John, could we take a break? Right sure, here for a sure. I would, I would like to move the camera back. Hey, yes. I was, okay. I was going to say to you, would you, what would it be like if I maybe, uh, I was if maybe I quietly move. For instance, uh, maybe it would be oh. wrong with the camera over to here, and oh, that would I'm change him looking. I would suggest that every looking. once in a while you look for Nestor to the camera, particularly when there's... Oh, all right, sure, sure. Okay, okay. or else I was thinking, Joe, maybe I could sort of sneak over there yes. every now and then, and he could look at me there. What do you think of that, or would that... Well, it's uh, easy, it's just to, to look... He does look around a little bit, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. I guess the, about the only thing I've really consciously looked at yeah, is... Yeah, I thought uh, of that, too, because you just occasionally, it in. Occasionally, no it was occasionally I'd shift myself, yeah. I'd see myself moving over there, and so I'd sort of look over that way to see what I was doing. <laughs> but I wasn't consciously looking at the yeah, camera. And this, uh, that, those are two things I thought, too. The, the Moore School uh, course, of course, was in 19... You mentioned the Moore School course was... The evening the graduate went down. There was 1935 or six. I'm not sure. Oh, which. Was that yours? The well, so far we haven't lost much time due to my inability to remember names. No, you're doing uh, well. No well, it was one name that I. That light on 
Lots of heat. The, la the, la the, the last, the second thing that we went through the second time, you know, I tried to remember uh, this fellow up at uh, Boston in the Arthur D. Little Laboratory, oh, uh -huh. and all I could do was I stuttered around a little bit, and then I finally says, well, you know, Arthur D. Little. <laughs> you know? I know I started to say that because I used to, I mean, I knew Arthur D. I knew yes. Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson, yes. who was president for a while. But the first time, yes, I knew first time I came out with the name of the guy himself who uh, I later became an IBM man. Now I can't think of it, you know. We all set then? Yes. So we'll go to the analog computer. Okay. Well, I was talking about the, the fact that I, to get uh, more efficiency in getting uh, my data ready for statistical studies, why we reduced some of it with an analog computer, which would. Uh, for instance, analyze for uh, waves such as in the atmospheric tides or in the solar rotation period, things of that sort. And this was something I could uh, easily build and uh, essentially design all by myself because it was a straightforward job. Uh, it was an analog computer. Maybe I ought to explain that term, you know. Uh, nowadays, we are so familiar with uh, the fact that computations are being done by digits. Uh, all of our adding machines, all of our multiplying machines, practically all that we know of in the way of computing and uh, figuring out either accounting or scientific problems is done by digits. But that isn't the way it always was. And in fact, uh, there still are things which are uh, more simply done by analog. Uh, that means, for instance, that we find a phenomenon which uh, uh, works in proportion to some other phenomenon, and then we use one to represent the other. Now, that may sound a little bit mysterious, too, but uh, take, for instance, the speedometer in your car. It, uh, at present, at any rate, it measures the speed of the car by uh, wheels, which uh, uh, first a connection by cable to your car wheels, say, and then that connection spins a little magnet under a copper cup, and there is uh, a cup which then turns under the uh, uh, restraint of a spring, and the faster the magnet turns, the further does this cup turn, and that cup has on it the numbers which tell you what speed the car is running at. All of this is making use of the fact that uh, in physical principles, the, sp the speed with which this magnet turns creates a greater force on the cup. And so the speed of turning there creates an angle which the cup points out what speed is uh, written down. It's written down in digits on your the dial of your speedometer. but as far as uh, the principle by, way, by which this worked, why it was all done by what we call analog. Whereas someday, I'll bet, there's going to be speedometers which work digitally, just as the mileage indicators, the odometers in your car do now. They, uh, something turns a little wheel, and the wheel, in the, when it gets around to uh, nine, will create a carryover digit which uh, turns another wheel, and that in turn, if it gets to nine, will produce another turn uh, impulse for a third wheel. And so your mileage uh, counter on your car will digitally tell you how many tenths of a mile you've gone, how many miles you've gone, how many ten miles you've gone, how many twenty miles are gone, and you just read it off from a set of digits. We used to use clocks where the uh, the hands on the face of the clock would uh, indicate what time it was, but the hands were just moving gradually around the clock. And uh, as far as we knew, why uh, we didn't know what moved them, but some kind of clockwork mechanism. Nowadays, uh, both our wristwatches and a lot of electric clocks uh, are digital. That means to say you read 
the, act, the digits off the thing instead of looking at the hands on the face of the clock. And so you can see there is a difference here. Another way of uh, somewhat illustrating that, I got, <laughs> while I've been speaking at various places all over the country in the past 30 or 40 years, why, uh, this, for instance, was given to me when I was sp speaking to some architects in Buffalo, and uh, they thought it was appropriate to give a computer man, especially a digital computer man, a gadget, which is one of the most ancient digital instruments, which uh, uh, you just slide one of these things from one position to the other, and in doing what I just did, for instance, I've counted to four. One, two, three, four. If I'd only slid over two of them, why, it would have represented two. In order that I don't have too many of these things here, why, of course, I can have one counter, which means five. And so after I get up to the four, I put these back and slide that one up again, and that means five. And then I have six, seven, eight, nine. Now, if I want to do ten, why, of course, all of these slide back, and I start on the next place here. Now, I can't remember at the moment whether this is Japanese or Chinese, but one of them is called a soroban, and the other is called an abacus. And this one, which you can clear very easily, you know, you can set it back to zero just like that. It's too easy, you might say, if you want to <laughs> save your numbers. Here is one which somebody else gave me. Uh, this is the pocket size, you see. It doesn't load you down to carry this thing. And this pocket size one has five counters here and one on that, whereas that one only had four counters and one. That's how you tell which country made it, I think. Uh, one of them got accustomed to counting up to five and then adding the other five there. So those are digital devices. Now, supposing I just represented the numbers by sliding something along a scale, and then if somebody says, well, you know, what does it indicate? You have to essentially read to a certain approximation where it is on the scale. That's the way most of us read thermometers. And uh, lots of other things in this world are still, you estimate. And that's why I referred to the fact that the accuracy that I required for my calculations for this weather were in that case such that I could use an analog device which would tell me approximately the numbers I should use. I didn't have to know to five digits or six digits or seven digits or so on. And uh, I could use the analog business there which measured currents on a meter where I could just tell approximately where the meter pointed and take the reading that way. Incidentally, if you look at your electric meter, it measures how much electricity you've used. Why, the little hands on those dials move around. They write down the numbers as digits, but you have to estimate the position of those hands. And so it's really an analog device. Well, uh, as I say, I was interested not only in trying to facilitate the computations as easily as possible by building something which one of my students could use for helping make one kind of an analysis of weather. I was also interested in the longer range problem of how can I get these counters and things used in the cosmic ray work uh, to broaden their usefulness by turning into fast computers which would be very much faster than the desk computers I was using. And I might say I hoped also that when I punched in some numbers for a particular thing that I was trying to do, if I had to use those numbers over again, I would like the machine to remember those numbers, not have to do that punching all over again. And I couldn't afford the punch cards, which other people were doing. So I began wondering, how could I do this both cheaply and faster with electronic methods? Incidentally, one of the discoveries I made while I was uh, working there in Ursinus College at uh, the local hardware store had a new thing which was called an indicator fuse. Fuses, when they blow out, 
you know what I'm talking about, a protective device which if you put, try to draw too much current or have a short circuit in your lamp cord or something, bingo, out goes the fuse. And that cuts off all current in that circuit. And you have to replace it with a different fuse in order to restore that. The second fuse, of course, the replacement may burn out right away if you haven't cured the short circuit. Well, here is the hardware store carrying a fuse which, when it burned out, uh, showed a little red light, which was actually a little neon bulb, using the same gas and the same principles of physics and so forth as are used in the, all the large neon signs that any, anybody was beginning to be familiar with in those days. And so these signs, which uh, created all the nightlife for Times Square and many other places, all the advertising practically started going over to neon signs instead of just uh, Mazda lights that were screwed in to the sign and burning out every so often. These ne little neon bulbs were miniature and were built into the fuse so that when the fuse link burned out, that just a teeny bit of current would go through that lamp and you would see right away when you looked in your fuse box which fuse was burned out. Great. I immediately then bought a carton, 25 it turned out, of these uh, indicator fuses and got myself 25 neon lights. I maybe had to pay 25 or 30 cents for an indicator fuse, but where else could I get a little cheap little light like that? I had to pay a dollar, a dollar and a half, two dollars or something for a vacuum tube for some of my other experiments. This was a promise of having something which worked electronically and which was very cheap and very small and also created a visible indication when it was on. So I soon found out that by ordering these same little neon lamps from the General Electric Company, I could get them at like eight cents a piece. I didn't have to pay 25 cents or more for a fuse and tear it apart. So with all of these neon lamps, I began constructing digital devices which uh, were cheap. Were they the ideal? Well, not to somebody who was looking mostly for speed because these little uh, electronic things which used gas as their uh, main, uh, main device, you might say, in there, uh, were slow compared to vacuum tubes which, in which the electrons could be stopped and started in the millionth of a second. The gas tube could be put out or turned on in more like a thousandth of a second. And uh, so I was willing to sacrifice, these are always known as trade-offs in the engineering world, I was willing to sacrifice some of that speed that I might gain for uh, the convenience of being able to buy a lot of these things cheap. So I did a lot of experiments with little counters which were made up of these neon bulbs, and I still have some around here, which uh, were uh, identified by some people as uh, toy railroad crossing signals because as the two neon bulbs in one circuit, one would go off, the other on, off, on, off, on. Each time that a pulse, a signal came to this circuit, why the one that was on would go off and the one that was off would go on. Nowadays, this is usually called a flip-flop. This is a device which can only exist when it's electrically fired up, so to speak. When it has the electric power, it will either be in one state or another. And so you could tell then how many pulses it had, an odd number or an even number, if you knew how the thing had started off. There are lots of different ways that you can go ahead and uh, try to use that for counters and so on. And I thought, well, I'll just have to explore that further. But while doing all those things, I also built a cryptographic device, uh, which is the shortest way of explaining it. Use a long word like cryptographic. This is a device which uh, you can 
essentially write secret messages and then decipher those messages again all through some electrical means which in this case used a vacuum tube I'm mean, used a neon bulb brother to indicate which letter was indicated and uh, so all the letters of the alphabet were on a big board and there'd be all these neon lights and as one keyed in a letter then its secret code for that would be shown on the illuminated neon bulb and then you could set this so that it would do the opposite it would decipher that code and give you back what the cryptologists known as a clear text give you the original message I uh, took that down to uh, the uh, Army Security Agency it was then in Arlington, Virginia and uh, showed it to uh, uh, the main fathers of cryptography down there and uh, they were interested but it wasn't quite suitable for their uses at that time I learned a lot about cryptography just by doing that well this is a, gives you an indication of some of the things that were going on in that laboratory and some of my students that I've seen later uh, are glad to uh, tell me about how what they remember about what was going on all the things I was building and they they add that to the experience they had of being taken to the Bartol Foundation and the uh, uh, terrestrial magnetism's uh, high voltage laboratory and uh, places like that uh, as well as uh, uh, the Johnson Biophysics Foundation where uh, Kefir Hartline was uh, doing the work which later earned him the Nobel Prize. Well, the students remember all those things as being a good start to, for them toward a scientific career. What I'm interested in, of course, is that during that period, this illustrates the thinking that was in my mind as to what might be done, what could be done as to how do you build a computer which is faster and if possible cheaper and which might contain enough memory so you wouldn't have to put the same numbers in over again but without of course being as inaccessible to me as were the punch card machines which in those days you could only rent at so many hundreds of dollars a month and uh, I didn't have that kind of a budget so I was building these things and wondering how better to build them and uh, what I could learn about it and that's the reason why I went down to the Moore School for instance and uh, talked to Knox McElwain and uh, took his course in the evening graduate school on electronics although that course uh, told me about much about uh, space charge effects in vacuum tubes it didn't tell me how to design circuits for counters such as the cosmic ray people were building but it gave me an insight as to what was going on I don't think at that time I even knew that the Moore School was interested in uh, computational things but somewhere along the line as a result of their getting my name on their mailing list they kept sending me a mail which said that they had courses offered in various things like uh, theory of computing instruments so that indicated well that's a good place to uh, get into sometime uh, maybe they're interested in what I'm interested in but the time didn't come right then for me to do that first I thought that uh, maybe the way to uh, getting what I wanted in the way of computing machines was to get out of a liberal arts college and get into industry so I did such things as applying to uh, the civil service uh, and getting offered jobs uh, at Fort Monmouth in infrared detection uh, because I'd been a spectroscopist why well, that seems to them like a reasonable thing for me to do I thought it was more reasonable and I went down to uh, Wilmington to explore the possibilities I thought it was more reasonable to get into some of the big chemical companies who uh, certainly had a lot of money and lots of people engaged in research and they certainly must need spectroscopists and I thought that maybe my computing machines would uh, go along with that in some way 
the uh, people down in Wilmington, there were several chemical companies, and uh, they talked to me and they listened. And they gave a standard reply almost that uh, we already have a spectroscopist. And uh, they had a thousand or two thousand chemists, you know, but they only had one spectroscopist. But what more would you need? What could they do for you? And in fact, one of my good friends from Hopkins was down there, advised me to go back to the hallowed halls of academia and continue to teach because that was the main thing I'd fitted myself for. I was used to that and I wouldn't fit into industry. That I just didn't realize that there were profits and other things in the industrial world and teaching, of course, wouldn't have to worry about them. Little did he know how I was squeezing the budget to try to get what I wanted <laughs> where I was. But, and uh, I had time scales and things like that in mind too. I, I figured that schedules were important, but he thought I was unfitted for uh, industrial use and I'd better go back and teach. So having explored that and found it seemed to lead to a blind alley, I elected to uh, continue trying to do something on my own. Two things, however, happened uh, to change this. It didn't change my resolve, but uh, changed the course which it took. One was that in giving my paper on uh, the application of statistics to uh, the problem of does the sun affect our weather, which I gave to the American Physical Society rather than the meteorologists, who I'm sure would not think of it very, uh, um, well, they would take, wouldn't take it seriously, we'll say. Um, at the end of that paper, why, up came a uh, man from the audience who said, I'm building a computer too. I'm interested in computers. It turned out this man from the Middle West, Dr. Ratanassoff from Iowa, uh, was indeed trying to build a computer. And uh, he told me he could do it very cheaply. That was interesting. And uh, come out to Iowa and he'd show it all to me. Well, I couldn't get out there until the following summer, which was the beginning of the 41 summer. And uh, when I did get out there, I found that uh, although he used vacuum tubes and he did do it relatively cheaply, why uh, he lost the advantage of the vacuum tubes because he wasn't doing it fast. And that uh, these are trade-offs which you've got to take into account that uh, if you're going to uh, do this thing electronically, why you might as well get the advantage of the vacuum tubes and make things for the same money, you might say, produce 10, 20, 100 times as much. So, I, uh, at the same time that I went out there, had just received a notice from the Moore School that a new course was being offered that summer called Defense Training in Electronics or something like that. I don't know the exact title, but the idea was that the war in Europe was getting closer. And here it was, 1941, and could be that uh, America would be involved in some way. It was about time that they get ready, and the, one of the ways of getting ready was to have as many people as possible available for work in electronics. Here at last was my course that I wanted. A course in practical electronics, not in mathematics of space charge, which I'd gotten before, but rather something that told me how to use electronics in practical circuits. Or at least that's the way I looked at it. That's what it seemed to be like. And uh, if I was eligible, I'd take it. It would occur during a couple months that summer. And so it turned out that I got the notice that I was accepted uh, while I was out in Iowa uh, visiting at Nassau and I hurried back and I went to the Moore School and I spent a couple months there 
with about 60 other students, I think, in uh, two classrooms of about 30 students each while we were getting lectures in the morning and labs in the afternoon to try to get us to know something about electronics because, of course, all these people were recruited from people who were not electrical engineers and didn't know anything about electronics. Uh, many of them were recruited from the University of Pennsylvania math department. Some were recruited from other math departments. Some were recruited from the physics department. All kinds of places. And among this whole big class, I think there were only two people that had ever gotten a doctor's degree. Most of these people were either bachelor's or master's degrees in other subjects. But uh, Dr. Arthur Burks from the University of Michigan, a man who was a professor of mathematical logic, and I, who had my physics degree, PhD in physics, sat in that class along with a lot of people from the University of Pennsylvania and other places to learn what we could learn with the idea, of course, of the government side that we ought to be able then to take jobs in industry and in defense industry in particular uh, using that electronic knowledge if it became necessary. We had a fine time. One of the really important results of all that was that that's how I met Eckert. Now we're talking about John Presper Eckert, J.P. Eckert Jr., uh, who had just received a degree in engineering from Moore School and who at that point was uh, doing master's degree work, I believe, and who was asked to uh, see that the people in the laboratory course in the afternoon uh, were properly taken care of and uh, got the work done that was assigned to them. Well, it turned out the laboratory course was more or less what I'd been assigning to my uh, senior physics students, my more advanced people that are sinus, and uh, we'd bought a few vacuum tubes and have them made the, measure the characteristics thereof and things of that sort, which was part of what was being done in this lab. And so, well, whereas all these other people then had to be educated a bit as to the laboratory side of electronics, why well, that part uh, I didn't uh, need much help in and uh, so as long as Eckert didn't uh, have to spend all his time seeing that the other people got their questions answered, many of them went ahead all right, but he and I were free to talk and so we would sit around on the lab table dangling our legs and uh, spending the hours talking about whatever we were interested in talking about. Well, what were we interested in? It's funny, I can't remember what Eckert was interested in, but I know that I found out that he had a patent already. That was very impressive. He had a patent in television, a method of scanning television tubes by uh, diffraction of sound waves, by uh, using a sound wave through a tube which the light would pass through and then be bent to different parts of the television screen. See, in those days, the main ideas in television, which I'd seen at the Bureau of Standards, for instance, in 1925 or so, were whirling lenses around in a big wheel, a mechanical way of diverting the image to various parts of a screen. There was no electronics to it, really. And it was over at RCA and at Farnsworth's laboratory, uh, also in Winmore, uh, places like that, that the electronic image uh, methods of television were devised and perfected. So it's not unusual you see that at that point uh, the idea of using sound waves to make a television image uh, was a reasonable and important idea. So he'd already gotten his patent on that and here, here he was uh, just a, a young guy starting out as far as I was concerned. He was 12 years younger than I and uh, strangely enough he still is. And, uh, could we could we just uh, change the, uh, sure. the, the yeah, yeah. position now because this is we're at a really good uh, yeah.